happy spook season, everyone. <laughs> yes, happy Halloween, all. I'm here at the Japanese train, a.k.a. Matt. And I'm Master of the Lemons, a.k.a. Lemmy. And I have to say, I have been anticipating October for some time. I really love getting into the Halloween spirit. Last year, we did one Halloween episode. This season, we're really hoping to do two. It really feels like yesterday that Bertram episode was released like how I know. how are we a year away from that and that was like what episode four we're on episode 18 now like jesus christ we have had 14 episodes since then can you believe that 14 victims <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah yeah we've all scratched them off our list they're all ghost engines now and speaking of ghost engines that's who we're doing an episode on today it's really cool with the Halloween season because me and Matt had a lot to select from. At first, you probably think of like you can think of like one or two spooky Halloween characters. Like the last time we did this, right? We thought, well, who's like a spooky character? It was like maybe Ari and Bert, and then there's like Bertram. But since then, we've done a lot of characters that people might never have expected. Like uh, we did thirteen. We did the machine. Gor- <laughs> yeah, we did Gordon's snow machine. Like we're basically willing to tackle anything that has wheels at this point. <laughs> And so that really opens us up to literally any ghost character of any kind that's ever been in Thomas, we're willing to do. Um, And so that gives us a lot of options. That gives us Percy's ghost train, which his driver saw on television. That gives us, you know, like... The one from Halloween that appeared for a second or two. And it gives us uh, the ghost engine that Edward talks about in Scaredy Engines. And I've always especially loved this ghost engine, just because... One, it you can see it, like, for a split second in the episode, and you see it just enough that you can kind of... You, like, you can see the shape of it. You can see it's, like, Donald and Douglas's shape. You know, it seems to have kind of a spooked expression. It's really, like... It is kind of haunting. Like, the, the higher resolution image on the wiki is a little spooky. Like, it yeah, just it looks mortified and ghoulish, and it doesn't have to look rusted or anything. Yeah, like, you can see you can see just enough of it that it piques your interest, but not enough to give you the full story, which is cool. And, um, and the fact that Edward tells the story, too, I think is so charming. Like, like Scaredy Engine set a precedent that I really, really love, which is the idea that Edward has this, like, annual tradition of getting on the turntable and telling all the engines ghost stories, telling all yeah. the engines... And, Ed, and Edward's the oldest, right, and the wisest, and... And probably knows how to spin a good tale. And he's probably also just heard a lot of ghost stories. Because, like, he's been around a long time. This episode also set the precedent that the Fat Controller is making an annual tradition of sending engines to the smelters to get traumatized. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, Yeah, he does that a lot for some reason. It's like, someone's always going to the smelters on Halloween. I don't know why that has to happen so much. I guess Ari and Bert just leave the smelters to do their own thing (laughs) nothing gets done god damn it yeah there's that's their one halloween's their one night to roam the rails it's their christmas (laughs) it's their christmas yeah but like um but but this engine so i i want to go over what we have to go off of with this one i understand there are a lot of classes that look like donald and douglas's class that look like the 812 but this one looks eerily similar to Donald and Douglas in the show. Partly because it is. I mean, I, that's definitely what the modelers used. Yeah, it's one of them. So I think we could just assume that this is a Macintosh 812. Yeah. And so that connects this engine to Donald and Douglas, which I think is going to be a lot of fun. Because Donald and Douglas, I've always seen those two as like, you know, the way that they talk about like the wee engines in the hills, and they talk about the, uh, you know, the in the naughty gnomes in that one. What is it, Percy in the haunted mine? Yes. Where Percy talks to them, and he's like, "I'm really scared of this mine," and they just make it way worse, and they're just like, "Well, it's probably haunted." I mean, I, that's what I would guess. What do you think, Donald? No, oh, yeah, I think it's haunted. They're like that's their response <laughs> immediately, but they they do it like, like I would compare Donald and Douglas to kind of to Ghostbusters. You know, they're like. They are aware of the supernatural, they fully embrace and accept that the supernatural exists, but they're also really not afraid of it. They're just, like, very ready to, like, 
like if the Northwest, they're the, they're the utility engines, right? So if the Northwestern Railway needs some ghosts busted, they send Donald and Douglas out to bust the ghosts. <laughs> and Donald and Douglas will just be like, all right, we need, uh, we need about 50 vans uh, and uh, a cross and uh, some garlic. And, uh, like, <laughs> and uh, we need Gordon as bait. <laughs> <laughs> Gordon's like, what? Why me? <laughs> Come up with some BS reason, but really they just want to see him squirm. Um, <laughs> but, you know, I, like, I can just totally see the twins in that role where it, it's, it's interesting. Donald and Douglas are easily spooked, but they're spooked by, by the word scrap. They're spooked by dieselization. They just have PTSD, honestly. Yeah. They're spooked by the real world horrors. So the fictional or the supernatural or the spookier horrors don't really scare them like they've they're, they're they are really tough at this point they've been through so much that it's like they're not going to be scared of a ghost they, they they can you know they can have a beer with a ghost all right <laughs> they're scared of diesels coming in and taking away their work and and ending their jobs on sodor they're scared of like tangible stuff but like a ghost or like any supernatural spooky being they're like you know oh, well he's all right i don't really have a problem with him but uh Gordon seems like he's pale in the face. He'll just go right through us. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's like, like they're they're just gonna be so chill about a ghost, <laughs> which is why I think it's interesting that this is a ghost of their class. Yeah. I almost wonder if, because I feel like Donald and Douglas have a good relationship with Edward. I could even see it that Edward learns this story from Donald and Douglas. Oh yeah, that that's that's kind of what I was thinking. You know, <laughs> I feel like Donald and Douglas have a complicated relationship with their remaining brother who I also feel like is going to get mentioned in this episode. Yeah. So there's honestly kind of a bit of a triangle going on here where I feel like Donald and Douglas have this distance and nonchalance from their other siblings. I would say so. I mean, you run away from Scotland um, to escape dieselization while there are still steam engines there. You kind of, on some level... On some level, the twins have to say, imagine you're Donald. Donald has to just be like, okay, Douglas is my priority. I, I, I can't focus on helping everyone else. I just got to focus on Douglas. And it's the same thing with Douglas towards Donald. And so, you know, the two of them together kind of become each other's worlds, and they kind of, they, they, they leave everything else behind. They leave their old life behind, which is interesting because one of the 812s does actually survive into preservation. But, but it, it raises a lot of questions. Usually, we look at Donald and Douglas running away to Sodor, and we think that that's a wonderful, beautiful thing, and that's a happy ending to the story. And then 828 goes through the trenches, goes through the mud and blood of scrap, and comes out of it preserved. Yeah, and so there, you've got this other engine that's like back on their old railway that, uh, that holds it against them. And I think beyond even the living brother... It could really, like, provide an ethical dilemma for Donald and Douglas if they encountered this ghost 812, because they would have known this engine. They would have left this engine behind. Imagine Donald and Douglas being haunted by this ghost 812. That's what I was thinking, is this engine... This engine is more on the 828 side of the family that sees Donald and Douglas as just running away from the problem. Yeah. Especially because it's a ghost, right? Ghosts stick around mm-hmm. when they're like a, you know, a lingering spirit that hasn't had their, you know, they... They're disturbed. Yeah, it hasn't dealt with its unfinished business. I imagine that this ghost could not really pass on until it hashed things out with the remaining 812s and finally found peace, right? Like, maybe this ghost engine is sticking around partly because of that. I, I'd like to talk about its whistle, too. Yeah. Because Donald and Douglas are known for their whistles. They've got these really deep-toned whistles. Yeah. And it's interesting that, like, that's a feature that's emphasized about this engine. You know, it could be that that means a lot to an 812. It could be that that's a distinct feature. And so Donald and Douglas are proud of their whistles and are deeply offended when Gordon and Henry insult them. And so it could be the case that this engine, when it loses its whistle in the smelter's yard, that is a lot bigger of a deal than, say, if James lost his whistle or if Edward lost his whistle. Like, this, to an 812, is a big deal. Yeah, well, I, you know, I could I could even see this ghost engine being in denial of its own demise and is trying to piece itself back together, like, trying to pick up its own pieces. Oh. But the only thing it can't find is an 812's whistle. Yeah, and a tender, apparently. And, yeah, and, and a tender. <laughs> The ghost engine is just like, oh, damn it, I can't find a tender. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. God. But, like, I really think, 
Yeah, that that could be it. Like maybe you know, because because really, what they say in the episode is you know. In fact, this is unconventional. Should I just play it in? Play the audio in the episode right now? Yeah, sure. Because like that's that's probably gonna get it across better than anything. They say that on Halloween, the ghost engine returns to the smelters looking for his lost whistle. So they say that on Halloween, the ghost engine returns to the smelters looking for his lost whistle. So it's just this one sentence. This is what I love about these discussions. This one sentence has so much potential. So firstly, Halloween must be significant to this engine firstly if it's returning on halloween that that or the engines of the netherworld just decide to let the the gates of hell open a little bit on halloween god we're you're you're opening a pandora's box there which i am glad but you realize where the discussion is gonna go now matt it's gonna it's become, gonna go down uh, to hell yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah Things are going to get supernatural. This is going to be fun, because yes. we're going to have to talk about the logistics of ghosts and of train hell. Well, yeah. I mean, it, I, every Halloween, this stuff happens. Hmm. Yeah. So that's... So I want to get back to that in a second. We've got the engine emerges from train hell every Halloween. Okay, we've got that. Um, it, Edward also says that the engine returns to the smelters. And it's looking specifically for its lost whistle. So that's assuming that it, he lost his whistle at the smelters. Like, it's been taken from him. Or it could even be that, you know... So think of the scrapyard. Think of how all these engines, h- hulks are there, and they're all like the boilers and stuff of the Northwestern Railway's engines. The Fat Controller is stocking spare parts. I I don't know. I, I'm not compelled to take it take all the set dressing seriously, really. It feels gross to me that the Fat Controller would purchase the corpses of all of Donald, Douglas, Gordon, and Thomas's brothers and scatter them across the island so that he could repair them. That's true. And also City of Truro. <laughs> yeah, and City of Truro. Um, it's like, you know, it's it's weird because, like, when Godred's spare parts are taken and used on the other engines, it's traumatic for all the other engines. Like, it's a big deal, right? Yeah. So I tend to just ignore all the scrap on Sodor that's genuinely a full engine. I just kind of... I just kind of block that out. Yeah. Um, so how then does um, the ghost engine's whistle end up at the smelters? Well, I think this ghost engine is killed at the smelters. I mean, I, I, oh. I mean, I think that's really what the episode is saying. Is like, I mean, that's what a smelters does: it breaks down engines and scraps them. Yeah, it's just it's crazy that it's the Sodor smelters. Well, I don't think it is the Sodor smelters. Oh, what's what smelters do you think that they're at? Well, I'm probably somewhere in Scotland, if I had to guess. Um, I don't know okay. where in Scotland, but I, I would say when Thomas... Like, say, the only thing tying it to the Sodor smelters is the fact that Thomas goes to the Sodor smelters, bumps into an unrelated whistle, and then freaks out. And I honestly... I don't think that... Oh, okay. Yeah, no, I get what you're saying. Yeah, like, yeah. I, I don't think we need to rely on Thomas's reaction as much, because... <laughs> I think he's. I think he's just freaking out about nothing. He's and that's not the ghost engine's whistle. Yeah, that he sets he, off. He's gonna get five miles away, and then finally, what he's gonna stop and be like, "Wait a minute, this doesn't make any logistical sense. I don't even know that the ghost engine died on Sodor. He doesn't even know that the ghost engine is like, you know, real. <laughs> yeah, it's like he doesn't. He's freaking out about... He's making a lot of assumptions and then just panics. It really shows the internalized fear that Thomas has. He's acting all tough, but really he's very scared of ghosts. Like, it's interesting that you were so ready to accept the smelters on Sodor. Like, that that's where this engine... Um, where this story takes place. I um, think I just associated the whistle that Thomas sets off as being that engine's whistle. I but... mean, it could be. I The thing is, it's like... I think Thomas is really meant to look foolish, right? And so if he's genuinely discovered the ghost engine's whistle, he actually has something to be scared about. Like, that's kind of terrifying. <laughs> yeah, um, that's true. So I think it should probably be a different whistle. Um, but yeah. I but I do I do like the notion, though. But I would, mm. say that, I would say that this is probably... The location of the smelters itself, I don't think is super relevant. I think it just needs to be somewhere yeah. in Scotland, you know. Maybe somewhere that Donald and Douglas have visited. 
um, you know, and are aware of. But mm -hmm. ultimately, it's you know, it's a smelter like any other. Um, and really, what makes this particular smelter is relevant is that you have, out of all the eight twelves, the most spiteful one is scrapped here, and this very very spiteful eight twelve is just not willing to just accept its demise. It refuses to just accept that this is the end for it. You know, it's yeah, it's funny because I think that. Um it's the other extreme, like we talked about, whereas Donald and Douglas fled, the ghost engine was determined that he was going to get preserved. Yeah. And, and this, the ghost engine stuck around. Even after it was gone, it stuck around. Like, it's still drifting around the mortal world. It's like, it's so dedicated to staying around that it floats around Scotland and floats around maybe all the UK forever. Like, it doesn't... Tries just, to pull trains, but just goes right through them. Yeah, exactly. And it just gets more and more frustrated. I can just imagine this poor engine just trying to, to pretend like everything's normal. Imagine the ghost engine, after it's scrapped, it kind of it wakes up, right, in a yard mm -hmm. somewhere. Like, it hasn't passed on yet. And at first it doesn't realize it's been scrapped, right? And it's like, I, I'm, I'm alive! I'm alive! I can't believe it! I knew I'd stay alive. That express train just goes right through him. Yeah, yeah. It's like, it literally just, you know, and it comes right towards this engine, right? And he's just like, oh my god! Oh, stop, stop! And then it just... Yeah. And all that the, the living engine would sense that, oh, it just felt a little cold for a second. Yeah, exactly. Or or maybe, like, with the uh, the fact that it has no tender, maybe it's that this, en maybe this engine starts out in the yard... And, and is puffing around for a while before it actually encounters any other engines. And then it finally, like, mm. maybe looks in a river. Like, it stops beside the river, looks into it, and it's like, Wait, where is my tender? I've been traveling for, like, 50 miles. Where is my tender? I can't travel this far without a tender. And he, like, he looks into the river, and he's like, I can't be alive. If I, it, It's kind of like the equivalent of, like, you, as a ghost, you're walking around for, for ages trying to get your bearings, then you look down and realize you don't have any legs. Yeah. Like, it's literally just a wisp, and you're like, yeah. I'm a ghost, shit. Like, that's, you know, that's that's the feeling, right? Yeah. I feel bad for this engine, that's sad. But, like, I could, I could so see that. Yeah. Um, I think inevitably this engine has to meet Donald and Douglas. I would love to see that happen. So, so I, I guess the character we're building for this engine is... He's very he's he's stuck very... in his ways and determined to follow the example of engines like A two eight, who actually did survive. That if I stay the course, if I stay on the mainland and just do what I need to do, pull trains day in and day out, you know, just take the grind, then I'll be okay. Yeah. Donald and Douglas are the ones that are going to be in danger because they're going to get in trouble. It's interesting because Donald and Douglas really, you. Donald and Douglas are the survivors, so you might be inclined to say, you know, they kept fighting and refused to accept their own mortality, but really, the opposite is true. Donald and Douglas accepted, you know, we're just engines. We could die. We, our lives could be over if we don't save ourselves. Like, they understand that they're mortal. Mm -hmm. But this engine, this engine never did. This engine refused to accept that. And probably just kept on working in Scotland, you know, just as, as, as you know, working harder than ever before. Um, and ultimately that didn't save it. And it's sent to the smelters. And it's, it's interesting, like, I think really this engine, might, it, it might, like, track down Donald and Douglas. I imagine, I imagine Donald would po probably be a little bit more spooked than Douglas, because Donald's more sensitive of a spirit, whereas Douglas is more ready to brawl. So I imagine, like, maybe he would find Donald first, right? It's, I'm just imagining yeah. Donald. <laughs> He'd imagine, imagine it's nighttime, right? It's on the Little Western. Yeah, it's a moonlit night. And Donald is, like, kind of just calmly puffing along the line, along that, like, really watery section, you know, with all that swamp land and that bridge. And, you know, the moon is out. And Donald's like, oh, it's a beautiful night, isn't it? And then, and then all of a sudden, this, this engine just pops into existence in front of him and just goes and... I would say whistles really loud, but it can't, right? Woo! And so it's maybe like, <laughs> and, and maybe and maybe Donald like looks away. He looks out at the ocean with the moon cast on it, and he's just like, oh, beautiful night. And then he looks back to the line in front of him, and there's the engine just right there, yeah. just looking straight into his eyes. And he's like, oh! And he like he slams on the brakes, and the passengers fly forward in the carriages, but not enough for anyone to get hurt. And he just <laughs> yeah. he, he slowly stops. Right, buffer to buffer with the engine. He's like, who, 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 who are you? 
and 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 his driver's like, uh, Donald, you okay? There's no one there. Why'd you stop? Like, you know, he's like, Donald had like a total breakdown at that moment. It's yeah. like, you know, his, his fire bars collapsed or something in fear and his crew can't get him started again. And it's like, God, what made him react this way? I don't see what he's seeing. And, but Donald can see this ghost engine, his own, his brother. And the scary mm-hmm. part, I think scarier than seeing a ghost you don't know is seeing a ghost you do know. A ghost of, yeah, of someone, that, that's your sibling. Yeah. Like, he knows this engine's name. What's interesting is the uh, the engine would kind of be like, like, oh, he, he's, he's got a name now. Donald. Yeah. Ex- yeah, that's true. Yeah, because Donald didn't... And I guess all the best ghost train stories do have a number, don't they? It's always like, the ghost of number... Old number nine yeah. or whatever. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And so, what would this engine be, do you think? Maybe, like... Maybe the first. You know, what if you know? What if this is the first eight twelve? And so that would be eight between eight twelve and eight two eight. That would be so. That could be. So this would be no, old number eight twelve. Yeah, that could be. That could be pretty cool. <laughs> old yeah. number eight twelve. It's like maybe just the eight twelve. <laughs> like that could yeah. be kind of chilling if it's like you know there are a lot of eight twelves, but this is the eight twelve. <laughs> Right. And, you know, he's just sitting there in the moonlit night in front of Donald, looking him straight in the eyes. And he's like, I've got some questions for you. And Donald's just like, you know, like, he'd be shivering if he could. You know, his wheels would be wobbling. And he's like, he's looking at him and he's like, what, what, what do you want to know? And, and he's just like, I want to know where you left us behind. I want to know what was going through your mind when you and Douglas stowed away and left us all to be scrapped in Scotland. And, and Donald's like, look, I, I've got a train to pull. I can't really be... You know, like, at some point, at some maybe Donald at first would be scared, but then he'd be like, well, I, wait, 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 what? We, we didn't leave you by, behind. We told the rest of you you could escape if you tried. I, I, he, like, it starts getting kind of heated, right? And it's like, yeah. what, what, what would you have had us do? You know what? I'm not having this conversation anymore. And he literally pulls forward through the ghost, and he's like, wait, I, we're, we're not done with this conversation yet. Stop doing that. It's very uncomfortable. <laughs> stop! No, stop! Oh, I can see all your passengers in the coaches. No, stop! Stop! Oh, there's the guard. Hello, guard. Oh, God. like it would be really, be a yeah. real like you know a real you know fu moment. All the all the coaches would be freaking out. <laughs> yeah, yeah. If they can see this engine too, they would just be like they would. They would be just suddenly really see a ghostly face emerge from Donald's tender. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. God, <laughs> that'd be great. Just imagine. Yeah. So that's you know. So Donald, Donald puffs off. And it's like, and in and, and, and maybe he shows up at Tidmouth, and Douglas is there, and uh, Donald puffs onto the turntable. But Donald at this point isn't scared anymore. He's angry, and he just turns on in, into the berth. And he's as he's pivoting on the turntable. Douglas wakes up, and he's like. Oh, oh uh, hello, Donald. How did things go? And, and Donald is just like, I saw 812. And Douglas is like, what are you seeing in 812 right now? I don't know. I saw 812. Oh. Like, and, that, that, and that, would be a, that would be kind of a chilling moment, too, because they haven't called this, um, like, the, like, they haven't called each other by those numbers, by the 800 numbers, in, like, what must be, like, 40, 50 years. <laughs> So this, there's this coded language where if Donald mm-hmm. says, I saw 812, they know exactly what era they're talking about. They know exactly, like, who they're talking about. It's like, yeah. it, even if all the en- other engines in the shed were awake at that moment, um, it, it, like, they wouldn't get what they were talking about. They're like, what is 812? What the hell? Like, I know you guys are class 812. It's like, no, 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 812. Like, the engine number 812. The first of its kind. The first of our kind. That would really be chilling. And Douglas wouldn't, mm-hmm. there wouldn't be this weird period, like in most fiction, where Douglas questions Donald, and he's like, I don't know if that's true or not, and then the next night he sees it, he'd just be like, oh, god damn it, that guy? And then Donald's like, yeah, that guy, he's back. You know what's funny is, what if they needed to get in contact with 828 for the first time since they left? Yeah, this, this, this 812 engine, the 812 keeps harassing them around Sodor, and eventually it gets so ridiculous, Donald and Douglas are like, look, we've got to go talk to the other remaining engine of our class. Like, the three of us need to convene on how to get this 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 ghost brother to stop to stop squatting on our island. <laughs> like, how do we yeah. how do we get him out of here? Like, there. It- What's interesting is 828 is the last of the batch that 812 is from. That's interesting. So you've got the last of the original batch that survived, and the first of it 
that didn't. It's like a Scrooge and um, whoever the guy was that died with the chains. Marley? Marley, yeah. It's like Scrooge and Marley. Yeah, that's interesting. Like, I just love the idea of Donald and Douglas encountering ghosts and very quickly, like, normalizing it and realizing, okay, well, it's a ghost. Mm. It's scary and spooky and everything, but, like... It, it's we know this engine like just because he's floating around doesn't change anything so you know they they understand that this is overall this isn't as much a supernatural problem as it is an emotional problem they yeah he just has beef this ghost <laughs> yeah ex- exactly and so like with any other engine they're gonna have to try and squash this beef so the next day they'd have bags under their eyes because they've been up all night mm-hmm. you know but they're they'd look more pissed than they would scared or tired and they and they'd have to talk to the fat controller and be like sir I know we've never done this before, but we're going to have to ask for a vacation tape. <laughs> <laughs> and the fat controller's like, I-, I beg your pardon. Like, he's totally shocked. He's yeah. like, you have never asked for a vacation day in all of my 60 years of having you on my railway. I know, I know, it's really, uh, really serious. Well, uh, granted, take as much as you want. Like, Gordon, I imagine <laughs> Gordon has a day off, like, every week, right? Like, Gordon, Henry, James has whatever the engine equivalent of spa days are, like, twice a week. Yeah. Whereas Donald and Douglas have never taken a sick day in all this time, never taken a vacation day. They are the hardest workers ever. So when they take vacation time, that's a big deal. <laughs> like, that's, you know, that's serious. Yeah. It's like it's like if uh, you built up vacation time through work. Like Donald and Douglas would have enough that if they took all their vacation time, they could just have the rest of their careers off. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, that's perfect. So it's like you know, so so they take that time, and the fat control is immediately supportive because like Donald and Douglas have have held the railway up through thick and thin. They're, Donald and Douglas returned to Scotland. Yeah, they they literally that would be really cool to like you know imagine just them on a trip back to Scotland. And maybe they even... It, it would be interesting because they are probably the most famous Scottish steam engines, when you think about it. Yeah. They're probably, like, in, in Scotland, I'm sure there are a lot of famous steam engines and steam engine classes and trains and stuff. But, um, you know, Donald and Douglas are true Scottish. Like, they, are, they were built in Scotland. Whereas, like, a lot of engines just have Scottish names or Scottish trains or whatever. But Donald and Douglas are true Scottish. And they come back there, and maybe they're heralded when they come back. It's like they're really, you know, they're really respected for what they represent and how they've they've mm-hmm. given this image of the of the the hard the hardworking Scottish engine that's loyal and and, and good natured and like Donald and Douglas are just amazing role models, right? And so I imagine their time on Sodor and and what they've demonstrated through the books in the railway series and just what everyone knows about the twin engines on Sodor. Um, you know, it, it's resonated throughout England and throughout Scotland and throughout all of Britain. And so, you know, they, they are really, they're heralded when they get back. Um, but, you know, the one engine doing the slow clap at the back of the room is... Is 828 in the back of the yard. Exactly. He's, like, their one actual blood relative there doesn't doesn't want to see them. What He's would just... be great is immediately the crowd would try and, like, get the three of them together for photographs. Yeah, and he would just be, like, like if you're looking at it in terms of, like, if it's somebody who doesn't, you know, who doesn't really see the engines as personalities and just sees them as trains, then they'd be like, oh, what a great photograph, just a bunch of smoke box doors. But for somebody who's seeing these three as characters, they'd be like, oh, that one looks really angry and he's looking away. Or maybe all three are looking at each other angrily. It's like Donald and Douglas, <laughs> you know, like, it's really, they're not pleasant pictures. They're like, they clearly don't want to be talking to each other. Um, you know, but the three of them are reunited. And then, you know, and then that night in the sheds. You know, 828 is just like, why are you back here? And then, you know, Donald and Douglas are just like, look, we don't want to see you either, uh, but we've got a problem. 812 is roaming the rails still. I know he is. He's been here for the last uh, 40 or 50 years. Oh, well, has he? And you haven't told us. And he's, and he's like, yeah, well, I, I certainly wasn't going to. Like, it's, it would be interesting. Yeah, I wasn't going to tell you. <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. <laughs> It's almost to the point where, um, where 828 and, uh, 812 are kind of chill with each other. Like, 812 is a ghost, right? But yeah. the, the two Well, they agree is a thing. They're totally in sync with their mindset still. Yeah. It's just that 828 was successful. Yeah, he survived. But the thing is, 
they really they're in a position where they don't these engines are are kind of like it's kind of like twins versus twins at this point like yeah that's true it is except one of those one set of twins has one of the twins being a ghost (laughs) but but that's the thing you've got 828 and 812 versus donald and douglas and so you know in 828 and 812 they both kind of agree on this you know stay in scotland no matter what keep working for your railway never abandon your railway stick behind and hard work will get you through um and and it's telling that 828 immediately goes back to caledonian railway colors you know exactly whereas donald and douglas they could they got to choose their color they didn't choose Caledonian Railway Blue. Mm-hmm. And I think I think that says a lot. Like, they chose the same blue as Thomas and Edward and Gordon. They chose Sodor's colors. Um, or if you go with, you know, with the TV series, they didn't, they didn't go back to anything. They just stuck with what they had. And I think, ultimately, no matter what version of Donald Douglas you take, really, the, the, the point of it they is... They don't want anything to do with this mainland foolishness of just sticking around until you know, the powers that be have their way with you. They have pride in their country, in their in, in their Yeah, it, it's, but, they are proud of their, their country, railway. but their railway did horrible things to them. Yeah, and, and they so they, no and, and they've been through a lot of railways, too. They've been through the Caledonian Railway, they've been through the, you know, they've been through the LMS, a weird period where Donald and Douglas are owned by the <laughs> LMS. Then you've got BR. They've been through three separate railways. Now four when they get to the Northwestern. So ultimately, I think the Northwestern is really the only one that ever respected them and, and defended them and, and, and welcomed them in with open arms. Mm-hmm. All the other railways kind of used them as props, and they understood that. They love Scotland, they love its culture, they love their homeland, but they, the railways that have always you know, used them for their, for their motive power, they don't have any allegiance to them. They they are like political exiles in, in every sense of the word. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And the interesting thing is, even though the railways in Scotland totally screwed over 812 and he is literally a ghost now, <laughs> even though that's the case, he still is sticking by them. He's still like, you know, he's kind of, like you said earlier, he's kind of in denial that he's even really a ghost. Like, his staunch loyalty continues into the afterlife. Yeah, he refuses to leave his railway because leaving his railway, he has to admit that his railway betrayed him. And that hurts too much. So instead, he's just like, no, I'm going to stick behind on my railway. So then does he come out every Halloween? Or is he constantly around? It could be that maybe this engine, the, maybe the, the 812, comes to the Northwestern and harasses Donald and Douglas a few years, right? Maybe mm-hmm. harasses them on Halloween, but then he leaves. So the next day, Halloween's over, everything's fine, and Donald and Douglas are like, Ugh, I, I guess we'll just move on from it then. Uh, but then he does it the next year. And then they're like, okay, this is getting kind of annoying and distracting. And then the third year and fourth year, and eventually they're like, okay, that's enough. We've got to go to Scotland. And that's the point where they actually <laughs> go off to Scotland. Yeah. And so he's literally, he's doing it every year, and eventually it wears them down, where they're like, you are ruining Halloween. We love Halloween. Yeah. <laughs> you, know what'd be, you know what'd be great is that, uh, how does the ghost engine feel every year that he's doing this? So I'm assuming every year some power allows the ghost engine to along with many other ghost engines to return um to you know make a mess or whatever so then he comes back down to let's call this train hell or whatever (laughs) and every year like okay i can't help but have that like pearly gates mindset where there's someone at the door every year is like no whistle again shut up (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like, like the ghosts get to leave hell on Halloween night every year, and 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 they and a lot of them like go back to see sites that they really care about or that make them happy. But this engine obsessively goes back and looks for his whistle. Like that's what that he would does. be really sad. Like a lot, of, like some of the ghost engines go back and just try yeah. and spend a night with their family. But then this one is just like doing this pointless endeavor yeah of just trying to be alive again yeah, exactly um, it's like that's that's so sad you know what if it's this what if this engine is genuinely like he shows up on sodor he harasses donald and douglas but when they ask him what he wants he's like i just want my whistle back like that's literally what he wants back and they're like hold on hold on you didn't come here to settle a beef with us you didn't come here to see us again you didn't come here to see your own brothers you just want to know where your damn whistle is and he's like 
that's alright, I want to know where my whistle is. And it's like, it's kind of hurtful. It's like, Donald and Douglas at first are scared to see a ghost, but then they're like, okay, but if a ghost is gonna come back to see us, that's the reason? He wants his... He couldn't have even taken us out for train dinner. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's like, like, what the hell? Like, really? He's just here for his whistle? And he's so obsessed with coming back to life that he's not making amends. Like, you know, he's... He's, he's so not... stuck in the past that he's disturbing others and disturbing himself by not letting it go. Yeah, no, exactly. You know, and it's like... And likewise, I think that, you know, it, it would be the same thing with, like, with 828. Is like, you know, he... For years, he's been coming to what used to be the Caledonian Railway, and every Halloween, 828 tracks out with him to s- different scrapyards and to the smelters, and they... It, I'm imagining... They go, this... they go hunting for the whistle together? Exactly. Like, that that's would what be, they do. That would be heartbreaking. Yeah. And so he's probably been doing this consistently since the very year he's been scrapped. You know, ever since then. Ever since that year. In the 50s or 60s or whenever. Um, 828 has been accompanying 812 on his whistle hunt every Halloween. And maybe at first, 828 is gung-ho, totally believes in what 812 says, believed in it when he was alive, believes in it now that he's dead, and, you know, he's just totally gung-ho about it. But then slowly over the years, he can he starts to realize that what 812 is doing is an obsession. Yeah. And he feels bad for him, and he's like, you know, are, are, you, are you sure you don't want to do something else with your time? I mean, you can only be back this one night. Maybe maybe don't look for the whistle. And, and, and 812 just... I imagine, imagine if you literally just rotated 180 degrees, even though there's no turntable underneath it. He, like, he could just yeah. do that because he's a ghost, just floats. He's just like, what did you say? And he's just like, oh, well, I don't know. It just seems like a waste of your time. Waste of my time! Waste of my time! This is not a waste of my time. This this is everything to me. My whistle. My I, I've, I've got, it's my pride and joy. I've got... I've got to get all my parts back. I've been fighting to get my parts back all these years. And then next is my tender, and next is this, and next is that. Like, it, I, I almost wonder if there's a reason why it's the whistle specifically. You know, there probably is. Like, like imagine if 812 was, like, you know, was maybe pulled, like, a, a special train. It doesn't have to be a passenger train. Maybe it's, like, a special goods train mm. that's named or something, right? And, and yeah. his whistle echoed through the valleys and that was the thing that really you know told people this big important goods train is coming right and that was his pride and joy that's what everyone knew him for and and now that whistle has been robbed from him he doesn't have that anymore he doesn't have you know mm-hmm. what what he was known for is, is you know his hallmark and so he's looking for it you know what would be great is if so i'm thinking about how this gets uh, what the resolution is yeah and it would it would involve a to eight and Don Douglas having to sit down with the ghost engine and say, "Fine, we'll all go to the that valley together." Yeah. You may not have a whistle, but we'll whistle for you. That's oh, that's really sweet. That's so sweet. Like that would and it would be really a kind of a, like they they'd all be annoyed that this has gone on so long, but they'd also be like, "This is what you need. We're gonna do it." Yeah. So they'd all go to the valley. They literally the three of them coupled together. And at the front is is eight twelve, but he you know he's a ghost, but he's you know he he kind of keeps pace with them, and they literally retrace his old route exactly and blow you know blow their whistles for him as they go through that valley, and he just needs like it's he gets a lot more emotional than he expects and he like he actually sheds yeah. some tears and he's just like it feels so good to do this again. And, you know, Donald and Douglas kind of start, like, they've been pissed off at this engine for a while, but now they're kind of starting to loosen up, and they're like, they, they, they've they spent so much time in their lives coping with what happened in Scotland and all the dieselization and losing their family. Without any closure. Yeah, exactly. And now this is closure for Donald and Douglas, too. Four 812s together, something Donald and Douglas thought would never happen again. And it's mm-hmm. deeply moving for them. And they're just, you know... May, I even imagine if this was a story, right? If this was all structured, all nice and pretty, mm-hmm. then the beginning of this story, before the ghosts even get involved, would be Donald and Douglas being rather... that They'd be kind of tense on Sodor, biffing trucks harder than usual, just kind of being like... Like, like they need a release. They need a, you know, a level of tension removed. Because deep down, they seem well-adjusted, but they've never yeah. fully dealt with the grief. 
and this story helps them do that. So after this, when they come back to Sodor, and they've, they've done that midnight run with 812 and 828, they are even more relaxed than before, and they kind of, they settle into, like, an even more calm, kind of relaxed old uncle role. Like, now, maybe before they would get into more arguments and brawls with Gordon and with... with <laughs> brawls with <laughs> Gordon. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, please! <laughs> <laughs> but, like, you know, before they would get in, they would get into a lot more, you know, fights. And now, mm. they don't. And and they, they used to carry with them a level of tension where they where they resented the... Um, they resented 828. They they had a lot of unresolved issues. Yeah. They had They had a story that never really concluded the other 812s on their railway I, I imagine none of them supported them when they all fled you know when donald and douglas fled scotland that was probably a very unpopular move and it took a lot of confidence not just for douglas to escape when he hadn't been ordered but also to go against what their whole family was telling them they were probably saying stay stay just stay here why, why are you going and you know and but they leave anyway and they probably feel a level of guilt but they probably also feel a level of resentment because they're like why did everyone tell us to stay when they literally all died after that like we were clearly mm. right and we never got to show them we were right and at the same time i wish that they would listen to us so they could actually survive and there's all this all this emotion right and that all comes out on that midnight run and that's just that is the point where donald and douglas finally have full closure that'd be a great title for that story too is the midnight run <laughs> yeah no that would be pretty great and and the this whole midnight run through the valley thing where the A twelve finally hears the whistle also means A twelve finally passes on. Yeah, so he actually vanishes and then they can't see him anymore. Um, yeah. Like would, by the end of the run, A twelve is just gone. And yeah. doesn't come back next year. And it's like and maybe eight twenty eight is actually really bummed about that, that he can't see another eight twelve anymore, and Donald and Douglas are like, <clears throat> Well, you still got us. And he looks over and he's like, would you be willing to visit? And, and, and Donald and Douglas kind of look to each other and whisper. And Donald's like, we should. And Douglas is like, I don't know. I, I still don't like this guy much. And Donald's like, come on, Dougie. He's going to be lonely. And they're just like, fine. We'll visit a couple times a year. And, you know, and they have some sort of arrangement. And they actually, mm -hmm. you know, in a weird way, 812 through his through his bitterness and through his desperately begging them all to help him get his whistle back, he actually reunites all of them. Um, you know, so they actually finally keep up ties again with their one remaining brother, which would be really sweet. So 812 finally passes on, and I think that's a really beautiful ending for it, because, like, 812 actually makes a big difference on Donald and Douglas's lives, on 828's lives. Literally brings them together, and I, I, you know, I have to say, I have wanted to do a character gallery on 828 for a while. That, that's <laughs> one of those engines that I thought we were always going to get to. Yeah. That we needed 812 first to yeah, <laughs> begin I... to think about this. It, it would be interesting if Donald and Douglas go through this whole conflict, and then they kind of have to tell everyone, oh yeah, we're going to Scotland every year. Yeah, <laughs> that's true. But they tell Edward first why they're gone that yeah. Halloween. They would tell Edward, like, you know, we've got a ghost problem. And Edward's like, say no more, I've got it. And, and by the way, can I use this as material? <laughs> <laughs> they just look at each other a little bit annoyed, and they're just like, oh, fine. <laughs> But you gotta credit us. And Edward's like, I'll credit you at the end. But it won't make it into the narration. Uh, <laughs> and, like, they, and they leave. Like, <laughs> that's great. I love that, yeah. like, Edward, this is, one, this is Edward's one creative outlet. It's his, like, ghost yeah. stories. He doesn't have any other... I don't know if Edward's a particularly creative engine. He's, like, incredibly wise and, and knowledgeable. and He's just and a really good storyteller. He's really good at regurgitating what he's heard yeah. in, a, in a good fashion. Yeah, that's true. But, yeah, yeah. I, I think that pulls a lot out of this engine. And ultimately, I think it's anything that has anything to do with Donald and Douglas, I think, immediately has a lot going for it. They've got a lot of facets to them. You know, they're at the heart of dieselization. They've left behind a whole life in in scotland which is really you know just rife with potential for a halloween story leaving behind your whole world and then it coming back to haunt you is literally everything Go donald and douglas are about um yeah. so that's you know that and that just works perfectly with this engine it's like and to think it's just the fact that 
the model makers decided to pick Donald and Douglas to represent this engine in these few frames. Right? Yeah. <laughs> it was, it's literally on the wiki, the last vehicle character created by David Bitten before his departure and death. <laughs> oh, God. So thank you, thank you, David Mitten. Yes, that's a very spooky way to word what happened next. Also, Jesus Christ. <laughs> yeah. But um, but yeah, for his I... departure and also death. <laughs> but you know, I think the idea of a closure story with Donald and Douglas is pretty beautiful, and yeah. and just the idea of a spirit being left behind and and dealing with. The, the fallout of being scrapped, you know? Because engines are afraid of being scrapped. Well, we never see an engine react to being scrapped, because they're scrapped. <laughs> but, like, an engine yeah. an engine reacting to, okay, I'm scrapped now, how do I feel about it, is a very interesting prospect. We talk about Donald and Douglas a lot, and we have a lot of interest in those characters. Um, that was naturally the route that we found to tell this story. Uh, and mm-hmm. I think it worked out really nicely, and I really love the, the kind of personality we came up f- with for this guy. Um, but I'm also very curious to hear, you know, this is a highly mysterious engine. What do you guys think about this engine? And we have nothing to go off of for this character, so any, you know, the, it's a totally free roam. You could literally write something from scratch that is just radically different, involves different characters. It is, it is such a free-for-all, and I just love it. Really, this episode allowed us to play Edward and tell our own ghost story, and I love that. Um, and we hope to do that one more time this month as well, because God, do I love the Halloween season. I, yeah, th- this is terrific. And honestly, this is kind of a character gallery twofer. We got A12 and A28 a little bit, so. I mean, it's basically, this is the A12 family episode, which is really, really fascinating. Um, but anyway, so, you know, we've said our piece, I think. Yes. You know, I've been Master of the Lemons, a.k.a. Lemmy. And I'm here the Japanese train, a.k.a. Matt. And thanks for watching, everybody. Happy Halloween. They're creepy and they're kooky, mysterious and spooky. <laughs> they're all together hooky, the A12 family. <laughs> woo, oh my woo. God. <laughs> really, though. <laughs> all right. All right. Take care, guys. Yeah, see you, everyone. <laughs> <laughs>